Hi and welcome. So this time around we're going to take a look at a tool that I didn't need at all, uh, but I've been curious about and I think uh, it's possibly a bunch of you were curious about as well. Um, I take, took my meager YouTube earnings a couple months worth and just reinvested into the channel. Uh, because if I buy this based on uh, the YouTube earnings, uh, you get a chance to see it and get a little more insight as to whether it's worth uh, spending any money on at all if you have a need for it. So uh, that's why I purchased it. Um, there are two versions of this guy, and there's a 120 and a 240, and the 240 volt one has slightly higher capacity. Uh, one of the advantages of 240 volts, besides the slightly higher capacity, is that on the input side the current is halved. You double the voltage, you have the current for the same amount of power dissipation. Power equals current times voltage. So uh, what that ends up meaning is that uh, you have potentially, if they could make the windings on the secondary side uh, thicker, you could get twice the capability, but it doesn't have that. It's just slightly better. So I got 240 because I have 240 in my garage and uh, uh, let's call it my workshop. <laughs> uh, so let's just open this guy up and uh, take a look at it. We'll uh, try welding some materials together, uh, spot welding some materials together, see how it works. So it's uh, typical Harbor Freight packaging, uh, uh, barely protects it uh, or doesn't even necessarily protect it the whole, uh, whole way here. You can see there's some big holes in it. They use, uh, they use looks like single walled or double walled cardboard but it's that really soft, crappy cardboard that uh, they use a lot, and uh, it's really easy to puncture. A lot of a lot of normal cardboards aren't so easy to puncture. Uh, this guy, this guy was pretty much. I'll say going in that I don't have very high expectations of this, but I've been curious about it for a very long time. So uh, let me just set this down and bring it out here. Here's the unit unpacked. It uh, comes without an AC. Uh, connector on the end because for 240 volts you may not know what connector you've got on the wall. For example in my garage I went with these 30 amp twist lock style. Uh, I had 30 amp, uh, I've been using that for a long time in my garage ever since I got my first air compressor which was 240 volts probably 25 years ago. So um, I just stuck with these guys right here and they work fine for lower current for my welder which is higher current. I've got a whole different socket completely because it's 50 amps. So it looks like you've got to line these guys up. Um, looks like you can unloosen, or loosen rather, loosen this guy here and slide this out so they line up. Looks like they also came with some extra tips, which is pretty nice, uh, just one extra pair, because they are expendable items and over time they will wear out. I'll uh, probably end up making some more on my lathe myself. Uh, but for your average homeowner, that's going to be problematic. But for uh, the machinist community, that's probably not such a big deal. Copper is probably gonna be the biggest thing because uh, that looks like it's at least 5 8 diameter copper, and that's going to be expensive. All right, so I'm going to pop the handle on here, which just goes here like this. This part rotates freely. They provide four screws to put that on. Uh, some uh, specs they've given with this unit is... Uh, Takes 240 volts at 16 amps, uncoated, mild, galvanized, or stainless sheet steel. You notice they don't mention aluminum. Aluminum can be spot weld, but it requires specialized uh, power supplies to do it. Uh, uses high frequency, I believe. Um, they're also talking mild steel. So mild steel up to a combined thickness of 3 16 Now on the front cover, they say welds up to 3 16 They don't really mention that it's combined 3 16 So you can't take two sheets of 3 16 and weld them together. Uh, you can take two sheets of 330 seconds and weld them together, supposedly. And galvani galvanized steel 16 gauge max. Oh, two pieces of 16 gauge, uh, 60, 59 thousandths thick uh, sheet metal. Um, that's a pretty good range, actually, so I'm not complaining. Uh, let's uh, get this guy assembled and we'll take a further look. Looks like it's uh, two screws per side and uh, they didn't mask the threads off when they were painting it although the screws seem to go in pretty well anyways, which makes me think uh, the way they handle it was they uh, made the threads kind of loose. They don't make a pretty tight, a very tight fitting thread to begin with, which would be my guess about what they did in order to pull that off. Probably simple, simplifies the manufacturing process a little bit. However, a thread holding in paint is probably not a very strong thread. And you'll notice, I don't know if you can see this. Let me zoom in here. 
Can you see the screw process around the center? There's a huge amount of run out in the screw head and all four screws were that way. I've never seen anything like that. So next up, I'm gonna loosen the uh, four uh, metric bolts here in the clamp so that I can get these guys out far enough to thread in a pair of these. Wow, these things come seriously tight from the factory. It's also four on the bottom, so you might be able to lo loosen either. Yep, they recommend uh, you cannot loosen either, uh, either set, but they are seriously tight. I'm guessing they used a torque wrench. I mean, an impact driver to tighten these guys. Either that or the glue's in there, because holy cow, are they tight. Well, it is not sliding freely like they suggest in the manual. And my guess is uh, they had it tightened so much that it has uh, welded itself a little bit to the bottom piece of material. Oh, there we go. Of course, being a Chinese made tool, 9 sixteenths is a close fit, but it's not the correct fit. Uh, it looks like it's actually 14 millimeters like this. <laughs> so they actually put some copper shim stock around it on the top. I don't know if that's because the hole size is different or what. That's a kind of weird all by its lonesome, if you ask me. So one thing I'm looking for is trying to keep the alignment very close because when you're spot welding, you have to keep pressure on the point where you're actually welding to keep the material in intimate connection with each other. Uh, if there isn't pressure, the spot weld won't work out very well. Now, high-end spot welders uh, have high frequency capabilities. They have pulse keep capabilities. This is none of that. Uh, this guy is a 50% duty cycle uh, spot welder, which will let you do uh, five seconds of spot welding, ten se five seconds of rest, five seconds of spot welding, five seconds of rest, rather than some of the more advanced ones say we'll have a capacitor bank they'd charge up and then control exactly how much current they dump for how long, which can be a big deal. I don't know if you can see this, but as, as I tighten this, it's pulling. Hey there. As I'm tightening this, it's pulling the top one back. So I'm going to try and get it close to centered as I tighten this. I don't think the tightening adjustment is correct yet either for that matter. So I've got the tip split initially so as you start to tighten it, it pulls back and lines up which is what I'm hoping for to set the pressure on the two tips. Uh, you loosen this front guy and then uh, the rear jam nut can be, can be adjusted as well. I think we can make that work. All right, so I'm going to go with that for now. This is a 17 millimeter wrench for the uh, the adjustment of uh, the pressure. And then to engage, there is a switch right here, a momentary switch right at the bottom of the handle. So I guess you hold, so I guess you're supposed to vice grip, according to them, vice grip the parts together or some other method of holding the parts together, uh, apply pressure, and then Flip the switch, you can spot weld for five seconds. Before I can do any of that, oh, it looks like it's got a total travel adjust right here with this uh, screw on the end. Sets how far this uh, locking handle can travel. I need to uh, terminate the end here. They've got it set almost like to go to a permanent outlet or something with screw terminals on it, but uh, that doesn't help me out because uh, I'm going into this Hubble plug here. On these connectors, they sh usually show you how much wire uh, strip, stripped wire you need. In this case, I don't know if you can see it on camera. Shows the insulation for, I don't know, three eighths of an inch and then a much longer section of stripped wire. And you can line that up if you need to. Okay. They have the uh, hexagonal screw, which is lightly painted green. I put some black sharp on because the green was hard to see, but they also made a hex screw for the ground and the two hots um, 
for 220 without a neutral, which is what this is. Uh, so let's start with the ground. And the two phases of 220, X and Y. And to be honest, I don't know what the standard is uh, for X and Y, whether one is always should be black and one always should be white in a normal setup. So I am just going to go... Normally black is hot, white is neutral, so I'm going to go with black as X. That's just a guess. Don't actually know. Can look it up. It doesn't really matter uh, for the most part, unless you're trying to connect two 220 circuits together in some method and you want to make sure the phases match. I would take the two circuits next to each other and I'd measure hot to hot voltage on my meter. If you get 240 volts, you know your opposite phases. If you get zero volts, your same phase. So that's how I would do it, just to make sure I was uh, going same phase to same phase. And uh, slide up the boot here. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, this is a Hubble. Harvey Hubble connector. They've been in business forever. At work, it's a lot of what we use. As a matter of fact, this one was thrown out from something at work. I had to take the old cable off it. I just cut the end off something. As you can see, it looks like it's brand new. That's how we roll. It's where I work. You use it till you don't need it, and then you throw it out. Before we move on here, uh, I just thought I'd uh, point out how this thing works. So this is just a basic transformer. That's all it is with a switch on the input. So 240 volts goes into the input side of the transformer. These are just, uh, this is just an iron core here with a bunch of plates that are insulated from each other to stop eddy currents from going around. Um, and what it does is it takes 240 volts on the input and let's see what it makes on the output. This is open circuit with no load. So on the output, 1.7 volts approximately. Uh, 1.7 volts on the output, which means it's a step down of about 150 times. What that means is if I put one amp on the input side, I can get 170 amps on the output side. In fact, this item is rated supposedly for 16 amps on the input side, which is about 2,400 amps on the output side, if I remember right. Um, now, in reality, you won't get that for a whole bunch of reasons. One, uh, once you start reaching really high current levels, um, the resistance of even large chunks of copper like this or this braid in here come into play. And uh, the IR loss, current times resistance, even if that resistance is 0.001 ohms, call it 1 milliohm, at 2600 amps, that's 2.6 volt drop. This only has 1.7 to begin with. You're starting to see the, the kind of crazy numbers we're playing with with high currents. Also, when you do really high currents, a transformer in an ideal sense will take the input voltage, reduce it or increase it to the secondary side, with the current ratio following that proportion exactly. But in reality, eddy currents in the plates uh, make you lose that, uh, some of that. And in addition, uh, even more uh, effect, having more of an effect, especially in really high current situations like we're dealing with here, you can saturate the iron core, which means you get so much of a, so strong a magnetic field in it that it can no longer contain the magnetic field and it leaks out. Once it leaks out, um, it's no longer coupling the primary to the secondary anymore and you won't get all the current that you're expecting. So in reality, this is probably a lot less than 2400 amps, uh, but that is the, the numerical ideal. Uh, I could hold this all day long and turn it on. Uh, I'm not recommending anyone do this because you really need to know what you're doing and you could hurt yourself if you ever get a situation where you touched uh, uh, voltage you, that you shouldn't have. Uh, but in this case, this is 1.7 volts AC uh, the average dielectric breakdown of your skin is about 70 volts, uh, so you wouldn't even feel this. Uh, you might, some people start feeling around 50 to 70. Uh, I tend to not feel it until you hit around 90 because I have very dry hands. Uh, but if you, you know, constantly moisturizing, it's going to be so lower because current actually would flow inside your body quite well because there, there's a lot of dissolved salts in your blood and your all the humor, the fluid inside your body. Uh, but it has to get through your skin first, which is fat, uh, which is made of a lot of fat. And fat is not a particularly good conductor of electricity. So you have to break down that outer layer first before the current can flow. Then once the current starts flowing, then uh, it takes almost no current to kill you. They always say it's the current that kills you. But in order to get that current to flow, first you got to break down the uh, dielectric of your skin. All right, let's try welding a couple things. All right, I got a couple pieces of 38 thousandths mild steel here. It's uh, some really uh, inexpensive sheet stock. And uh, so let's give it a go. One one thousand. Wow, okay. <laughs> I didn't need to do the five seconds on that at all. Uh, wow, that looks surprisingly good. 
Look at that. Look at the strength of that weld. That's far better than I thought I was going to get out of this. Because this, again, is a really simple welder. All it does is apply a lot of a current in an AC signal to the through the part. Uh, in reality, for a lot of kinds of spot welding, if you want to get a decent job, uh, you need to use high frequency or pulse. Uh, you may need to use inert gases. Uh, you need to, might need to do some sort of controlled pulse. Uh, none of which this has, because this is purely applying 60 cycle AC. So I just... Uh, Took this real quick and put it in my vise to flatten it out. Let's see if we put another weld in it here. So just hold it down and... Uh... So I'm noticing that it kind of sticks to the copper and I'm leaving some copper on it. I wonder, and actually, I don't know if you can see this, probably getting this too close. It's actually pressing the copper uh, tips into the material a little bit. So when it melts it, it's actually melting into the part. But the spot welds are excellent, actually. I had no idea it was going to be this good. Look at that. Let's try one more here on the other side. I probably don't need to go as long as I was going there. Let's try faster. Yeah. So you can see also the way it's pushing in, it's uh, digging the tip in at a slight angle. But the welds are pretty darn good, I'm impressed. Now, I have here some blue steel, uh, 1095 spring steel. And from what I've read, spring steel is going to be problematic because this works by melting the material, which means you're raising it to a high temperature. And then it cools off fairly quickly because you're attached to big chunks of copper. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, as it cools very quickly, it's going to remain extremely hard. This can get over Rockwell six, well over Rockwell 60. And so they say the welds will be weak. So let's try it and find out what happens. See if the weld breaks or I can peel it apart. Okay, it welded it completely. But it broke, and it, the weld itself looks like it shattered. So what you might need to do is anneal it after. So again, a solid weld that looks like it went all the way through, no problem. Very fragile, broke right at the weld. Now what I might try is... Uh, after I weld this, heat it up. So if you anneal this after you after you weld it, uh, it might uh, make a better weld, uh, a softer weld. So let's see how we did it. That's not a proper anneal by any stretch. I was just heating it to red and letting it sit there for a little bit. But let's see now if the weld is as fragile. And look at that. It is not. So you can spot weld spring steel together if you're willing to anneal it after. It's kind of warm, you know? But unlike before, it doesn't break. Just to be sure, let's try it again. So I'm going to cut the ends off this guy and we'll weld it again. All right, so here we go again, a couple pieces of 1095 spring steel. I'm going to put two welds in the end here. Lots of little bits uh, come off at, from welding this. I don't know if that's because there's carbon in it or what, but it's kind of exciting. Okay, so these welds are probably pretty fragile right now based on uh, past experience. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take a map gas torch here. And we're just going to heat those welds up.
And I'm covering the end with mill scale, which is nice. <laughs> and I'm going to walk it out in the flame so it cools somewhat slowly. And let's see how we did. I'm going to cool it off the rest of the way. So there's the welds. You can still see they're the same. Now let's try and pull them apart. And look at that. They are holding. Dropping little bits of mill scale. Oh. And you know where it broke? It broke right past the welds where the material was hard. But you can spot weld uh, spring steel together. Let's try spring steel to mild steel and see how that goes. I suspect that uh, without annealing, it's going to have the same problem. So spring steel, mild steel. So the spot weld went all the way through and the weld shattered right around the edge of the weld, which is what it did last time. So let's one more time. Weld this guy, these guys together. So I tried pulse annealing it by pulsing the thing on very quickly uh, to see if that helped but it did not. Still very fragile weld. So let's do it a third time. Our bandsaw at work is a very old dual um, off of a battleship and the uh, blade welder has a weld mode and then an anneal mode. And the anneal mode it just gets it up to, which I might be able to use this to do annealing as well. Put a uh, rheostat, get a 240 volt rheostat on the input and get the voltage down so that it's less current on the secondary. And uh, that might work pretty well. Okay. So the copper does tend to stick. I wonder if there's some sort of stu uh, chemical you like, some sort of lube that you can put on it that prevents the copper from sticking each time. All right, let's try and anneal the end of this and see if that's better. So I don't need the mild steel because it has almost no carbon. Okay. And look at that, weld doesn't break. So if you need to weld carbon steel to mild steel, a spot weld carbon steel to mild steel, you need to anneal it after, in which case you're gonna get uh, mill scale like I've got there all over it, and uh, maybe change the dimensions of your parts, you need to factor that in before you consider it. All right, let's move on to one more possibility. Well, if you're like me, you probably wondered right off the bat, well, can it spot weld aluminum as well? And the answer is probably not. Uh, aluminum is spot weldable through an advanced process, supposedly, uh, just reading online, uh, but it requires special uh, waveforms to do it, including high frequency. Uh, but I'm willing to try it. This is some um, 5000 series aluminum sheet, 50,000 thick, and uh, aluminum also dissipates heat really well. Uh, looks like it uh, melted. Ah, but the weld is no good. Probably because what I'd expect would happen is, is the interface layer between the two pieces, you get oxide stuck in there. between, And so when the aluminum melts, you get oxide preventing the aluminum metal from touching the other aluminum metal, metal and combining. Uh, I'm going to try cleaning a piece of this and see what happens then. I don't think they'll be, because aluminum oxidizes almost instantaneously, but let me see if I can reduce that oxide layer, at least temporarily, before the weld and see if we can get one to stick. All right, so I've prepared a couple clean spots there using Scotch-Brite wheel, which I know is not the ideal way to clean aluminum. Uh, but we're just going to try, this is just an experiment, which I don't think it's going to work anyways. We're going to apply a little extra force. 
and they did stick and it did look like it melted. Uh, by the way, this is 50 thousandths thick material, which makes this 100 thousandths, which is probably a little bit past the limit of what this thing could do even in steel. Well, it's right around with the limit of what it could do in steel. Uh, let's see, 3 16 total. Ooh, that's warm. So in steel, this thing can handle about 90 thousandths material. This is 50 thousandths. So the extra heat that aluminum dissipates uh, may make it work okay. Let's see, so I cleaned the spots between the welds. Whew, warm, warm, warm. All right, let's see if the weld held where I cleaned it. Uh, I cleaned it as if, well, I did part of what I could do if I was gonna TIG weld it, and the answer is no. It did melt the material and it deformed it, but the weld did not hold. And I think, again, that's because of the oxide layer and you've got to do something special to get rid of that oxide layer between. All right, one more thing to try is some stainless steel. So this is some stainless steel tool wrap, and this is the high temperature stuff, which I think makes it 316 stainless. No, it's SS309. So it's 309 stainless, which I'm not familiar with. 303 is uh, easy machinable. 304 is 18.8, which is the most common stainless steel. 316 is high strength. This is 309. Now it's good for higher temperature, supposedly. Uh, one thing I gotta be careful is this is fairly thin material. So we've gotta go quickly. This is 2000s thick. So I think we're gonna have to give it a really quick pulse. So it looks like it punched right through the stainless steel. And some of the stainless steel welded itself to the copper electrode, which I'm gonna have to clean off here. Uh, I don't know if I can get a fast enough pulse. You might need a 240 rheostat to do this thin of stainless. As I mentioned before with the rheostat, you can lower the voltage, which when you can lower the voltage, that means you can also lower the current. I could also uh, try and do four pieces together. That'll make it uh, a total of uh, eight thousandths. So let's see if I can do a really quick pulse and I'll try and put a little less pressure too. So I'll just put light pressure. Oh, okay, that welded. Let's see, does it stick? Yes, it does. The weld uh, ripped the material first. Uh, let's try that again. That was not quick enough. <laughs> oh, I wish I had some slightly thicker material. I don't think I have any stainless shim stock. I think I just have regular steel shim stock. So yeah, that just, uh, that welded all the way through the material. Let's try one last time. So here's very light pressure and as quick a switch pulse as I can make it. So I gotta say, with this thin material, uh, it's challenging to do. It's burning all the way through, but the, but it looks like it can weld it because the weld's stronger than the material. The material rips instead. So my, uh, my thinking is you can do some stainless as well. Final thoughts on the Harbor Freight 240 volt spot welder is for the money. I think it's a pretty darn good deal. Uh, if you were gonna make drawers or things out of, stain, out of uh, sheet, sheet metal, just mild steel, this thing would work all day long. Uh, you'd have to plan on redressing and possibly replacing your tips. Uh, but that's not a huge problem. It comes with some spare tips, so that's a really nice feature. Uh, it will do mild steel all day long. It will do carbon steel like this 1095 spring steel this is some strapping and uh, it'll do that uh, but the but the welds will be really fragile unless after you're done you anneal it and so uh, you can do that with a welding torch right at the weld and that seems to make the weld a uh, whole lot stronger you can see the uh, the weld survived the material broke up there um, it won't do aluminum and it will do stainless the only stainless i had that was even moderately thin was this uh, 2000 uh, stainless steel foil. And uh, without a rheostat to lower the voltage to get the current down, uh, it's just melting all the way through this. But it does look like good weld because where the weld is, the material rips before the weld breaks. So that's usually a sign of a good weld. So I'm thinking it can do stainless just on my initial test. 
So pretty much I give it a thumbs up, an excellent value for the money. Uh, there are other ones out there. Heck, Miller makes one like this, and I think they charge like $500 for it, and it's essentially the same thing. It might even be made by the same company. You never know. Anyways, thanks for watching. Hope you find it useful. Hope to see you next time.